Radioactivity. There are lots of things that can give off small or large amounts of energy and particles that we refer to as being radioactive, including minerals that come out of the earth and helpful medical technologies. Even bananas and your own bones contain substances that are slightly radioactive. In 1898, Madame Marie Curie first used the word radioactivity to describe the ability of certain elements to give off invisible energy. But did you know that this type of energy can be used to explore the solar system? Find out how next on Real World. When most people hear the word radioactivity, they think of mysterious glowing substances, nuclear power plants, or weapons. But you might not be aware of the vast differences between the different radioactive substances. These different substances give off different amounts of energy and have all kinds of practical uses, from bone imaging to smoke detectors, archaeological dating to food processing. But what makes a material radioactive to begin with? Let's start with some basics. All matter is made up of particles called atoms, and atoms are made up of smaller particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms of a given element all have the same number of protons, but the number of neutrons can vary. Atoms of the same element with a different number of neutrons are known as isotopes of that element. Now, some isotopes are stable, meaning they do not change over time. Others are unstable. We call these unstable isotopes radioisotopes, because to become more stable, they radiate or give off energy, usually moving particles plus heat. And this process is called radioactive decay. Radioactive decay is uh, what happens when an atom is trying to get to a stable state, that is a balanced state. You have a very unstable atom that likes to emit things from alpha particles to beta particles to sometimes gamma rays. But what it's doing is it's taking an unstable atom and going to a more stable state and releasing energy during the process. One of the most important things to know about this whole process is that the rate at which any radioisotope decays is predictable. Under the same conditions, you can count on it to happen the same way over and over. Now, for unstable atoms, there's no way of telling when an individual atom will decay, but through careful measurement, it is possible to predict how long it will take for a large number of them, say half of the atoms in a given sample, to decay. As the atoms decay, they change from one element into another. The time it takes for half an amount of any radioisotope to decay into another type of element is called its half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of the radioisotopes to decay from a more unstable state to a more stable state. And atoms of different types have different ways of decaying from this more unstable state to the more stable state. It is just the nature of the, of the element and of the isotope of that element, how long that half-life is, and it's a nature of how, um, what kind of energy it's releasing, whether it's gamma rays, whether it's heat, uh, whether it's other particles. Half-lives vary greatly, from milliseconds to billions of years. But each radioisotope has its own rate of decay. For example, iodine-131 has a half-life of only eight days, while chlorine-36 has a half-life of 300,000 years. Suppose you had 32 grams of sodium-24, which has a half-life of 15 hours and decays into magnesium-24, a stable form of magnesium. An understanding of half-life and some simple math can help you determine how much of the original material exists after a given period of time. After 15 hours, half of the sodium-24 would have decayed into magnesium-24, leaving 16 grams of the original isotope. After 30 hours, there would only be 8 grams of sodium-24 left, and so on until there's not enough sodium-24 left in the sample to detect its radioactivity. So now that you know more about radioactivity and half-life, how does NASA use Madame Curie's invisible energy to explore the solar system? Well, since half-life is predictable, scientists and engineers can use this knowledge to create power sources that rely on the predictable heat given off by radioisotopes as they decay. 
NASA's radioisotope-powered spacecraft use a unique isotope called plutonium-238, which is provided by the Department of Energy. It has a half-life of 88 years and gives off heat, plus low-energy particles called alpha particles. The fact that it's a long-lived source of heat makes this isotope an ideal fuel for long-lived space missions. A radioisotope power system is a special system that uses the, the decay of a radioisotope, in our case plutonium-238, uh, to generate heat. That heat then is uh, converted to power or electricity uh, that we use on spacecraft. This makes radioisotope power systems, or an RPS for short, ideally suited for missions in the extreme environments of space or on planetary surfaces, like some destinations on Mars. The Mars Science Laboratory rover, also known as Curiosity, has been designed to use a radioisotope power system as it explores the red planet. The RPS can generate electricity needed to operate the rover and its instruments, and excess heat from the power source can keep the rover warm on this cold, dusty planet. The steady and reliable output of its RPS should enable the large rover to travel further, last longer, and do more science than any previous mobile Martian explorer. Curiosity is designed to roam Mars for a full Martian year. That's about two Earth years. With its reliable, long-lasting power source, the mission could go even longer. And that longevity is thanks to our understanding of radioactive decay. So how about that? From laboratories on Earth to rovers on Mars, science and math can harness the power of radioactive decay to help make exploration truly a cosmic endeavor.